What's going on, everyone? This is the Fantasy Playbook Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I'm your host. I can be found on Twitter at KyleYNFL. I am joined today by the man, the myth, the legend, Nick Ercolano of BDGE Fantasy Football. Nick, how are we doing today, my brother? Wonderful. It's uh, 11 a.m., and I've had like three or four cups of coffee, so you're going to get a lot. This is like my time frame of really good energy plus a lot of caffeine, so you're going to get a lot of nonsense out of my mouth but you know as you said before this is the first time we've ever got to really like kick it on a podcast together and and chop it up so it's gonna be a good one you're actually outpacing me from a cups of coffee standpoint which is rare and i was up like three or four times last night with a five month old man so i think i'm gonna need to get on your level i'm gonna need to get uh, get there i think if we were doing this now like you said it's a sweet spot if we were doing it two or three o'clock you might be crashing. You might have the uh, the low energy levels there. But no, I'm looking forward to this one. A Dynasty Super Flex Startup Mock Draft. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Before we get into that, though, I want to let you know that you can watch this over at YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Playbook. Over here on the YouTube channel, closing in on 2,500 subscribers over six seven weeks the support has just been absolutely phenomenal thank you so much if you are watching over there make sure to hit the like button as well again youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook and throw a subscribe button in there while you are at it all right nick the mock draft here we got a super flex format like i said but otherwise we got two starting running back spots three wide receivers a tight end spot two additional flex spots and then of course the super flex and then we are going 16 bench spots brother and we are doing 10 teams this time i've done a lot of 12 team mock drafts here on the youtube channel on the podcast we're going to switch it up a little bit here today we're going to go 10 teams here all right so we got the 26 rounds we're going to go deep 10 teams let's get after it start this draft and get rolling you are drafting at the three spot here i've got the number eight spot we had patrick Mahomes and jonathan taylor go off the board at the one and the two spot you are now up at number three overall yeah i was kind of hoping uh taylor fell to me to be honest i there's something that still rubs me the wrong way about taking a, a quarterback in like the first round of a super flex draft, but it's nearly impossible to pass up on Josh Allen there. I think if I had the 101, I would probably take Josh Allen. So him to fall to the 103 is kind of a beautiful thing. There aren't many like I, I get the safety of taking quarterback in a super flex dynasty draft, right? You get like the totem pole and, and you just get to like stick it there for the entirety of, of his career for the most part. But there aren't a lot of actual quarterbacks that bring like league winning upside. Whereas the running back actually does provide that for you if they hit the ceiling, which is what Jonathan Taylor probably will. Um, but Josh Allen is actually one of the few guys that I feel like is a, a league winner, like a game changer for your team at the quarterback position. That's rare. So give me, give me Josh Allen to one three there all day. No doubt. I think that you said if you were, you were at the one on one, you would have taken Josh Allen. I'm there with you, Josh Allen over Patrick Mahomes in my dynasty rankings, especially after we've seen Tyree Hill move on from Kansas City here this offseason. Right. That's a big part of that offense. Patrick Mahomes is still fine. Obviously, he's still going to be phenomenal. But the the value there with Josh Allen seems to be trending up. All right. So then we had Justin Herbert at the one four, Justin Jefferson at the one five, Joe Burrow at the one six, Jamar Chase at the one seven. I'm up at the one eight and I ended up taking here Javante Williams. I'm going to take the shot here. With Williams, I looked at the quarterback board and I saw that Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, those guys are all fine, but I felt like the value for J uh, Javante Williams, if Melvin Gordon does not re-sign, and at this point of free agency, if that's still considered ongoing, Melvin Gordon has not re-signed in Denver. So I think he's going to hold out for a you know running back getting injured in the preseason. He'll sign there as a need. Uh, I'm going to push that quarterback need down the board a little bit. Go Javante Williams there for the upside. Back up at the 2-3 after we saw Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, Najee Harris, and Dak, Pres Dak Prescott go around the turn. I'm going to take my guy here. I'm going to go Trey Lance. I do not buy the whole talk of Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be around for another year. This is, again, like with Melvin Gordon, I could see this being like the Stan Bradford from several years ago. Like you, a quarterback gets injured in training camp. It happens every year. We could see Jimmy Garoppolo get traded at that point. Trey Lance is the future here. They sent away three first-round picks for him. I was very high on Trey Lance coming out last year, and I think that the sky is the limit here for him. So I'm going to go Trey Lance as my QB1 at the 2-3. We got CeeDee Lamb, Kyle Pitts, DeAndre Swift, Christian McCaffrey at the 2-7. Going off the board, you are now back up at the 2-8. Kyle, I love those picks, man. There's a uh, th that should get the that should get the comment section chirping a little bit there. Javante at the one eight, Trey Lance at the two three. I love I love that risk, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna play into the risk a little bit here since it's it's the theme of the show. We're gonna go with Deshaun Watson. All right, so Deshaun Watson here. 
landing and skyrocketing back up the dynasty rankings, right? But he had just been kind of in that purgatory, just kind of in that holding pattern for the longest time. And then we got the clarity that he's in Cleveland. Does the fact that he could be suspended here for, I don't know, say four to six games, does that play any part of the risk factor there with taking him at the 2-8? Or are you saying, because you've got Josh Allen, you've got that QB1 security already built in, you can come back later on and grab like a fill-in starter uh, for that time period? Yeah, um, give me a second to make this pick, and then we'll jump into both of those guys' evals. Yeah, yeah. And, man, the running back position just seems like it's a tier of guys who are super productive but super – uh, I don't want to say old because they're still like five years younger than I am personally, <laughs> but it's a, it's a weird tier of guys where I kind of want to take Brees Hall because the first round chatter is getting like numbingly loud with him. But I think I'm going to take a high upside wide receiver here and grab AJ Brown. It's typically not a strategy I go with like quarterbacks and wide receivers early in the first round in the first couple rounds. But when it goes to Deshaun Watson, like if I'm in a startup dynasty draft, the first five games of the first year of this league is not right. a concern of mine. You know, if, if this could be risky and he could end up missing the entire year for whatever reason, they just want to put him on the exempt list. And then maybe I regret it. But I mean, Deshaun Watson, I think, is a bona fide top five dynasty quarterback as soon as he touches the field so i have no regrets of taking him there because we know he's going to get back on the field sooner probably rather than later and in these in these drafts like you could always grab the way i'm thinking is upside later on and you can grab um you know a matt ryan probably in like the 11th round or even like right. a tom brady in the 10th round if you need to and then you get you know this carousel of like three high upside you know weekly basis quarterbacks. so deshaun watson the early suspension is not something i'm really factoring in right now in startup drafts so we got Cooper Cup, Tyree Kill, Debo Samuel, and Mark Andrews going around the turn there. Then you took A.J. Brown. I want to double back to that selection here. I'm going to make my pick, get that going. All right, let's go back to A.J. Brown here. So you talked about taking that. You typically don't go this strategy, but A.J. Brown, there's been a lot of trade chatter. I really don't buy that. I don't think that he's moving on from Tennessee. I think he's going to get handed a huge contract extension here. So A.J. Brown still within that top 10 territory of consensus dynasty rankings. I think that having him as a pillar there of your dynasty roster is a smart decision there. Then we got Jalen Waddle, Austin Eckler, Trevor Lawrence, Jalen Hurts there. And this goes to talk, like speak to with Deshaun Watson there. Once you get past Watson, now you're starting to get into some questionable territory. Trevor Lawrence, mm -hmm. we have no idea how he's going to bounce back. Jalen Hurts, we have no idea how long he's going to be the starter in Philadelphia, right? Then you start to get into some of the veteran guys. So Deshaun Watson there at the 2-8, I do think is the right selection. Then we got Joe Mixon that I took at the 3-8 to be my running back too over Brees Hall, who went at the 3-9. I will take Joe Mixon's here, uh, here still incredibly young. Uh, I, still someone that I'm perfectly comfortable building around. Got seven seconds on the clock. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Russell Wilson here. So, all right, let's wrap this up. Joe Mixon at the 3-8. Brees Hall at the 3-9. Malik Willis at the 3-10. That's way too early for Malik Willis, in my opinion. Antonio Gibson, Devontae Adams at the 4-2. Then I took Russell Wilson to pair with Trey Lance. If Trey Lance doesn't happen here, if it doesn't work out, we do see Jimmy Garoppolo. They, the 49ers make a massive mistake. They hold on to Jimmy Garoppolo. I've got Russell Wilson now in Denver to pair with Trey Lance, who's got the youth. I can come back and grab another you know, QB3 later on here in the draft to balance that out. So I've got Javante Williams, Trey Lance, Joe Mixon, Russell Wilson as the start of the draft. DK Metcalf, Dalvin Cook, George Kittle, Matthew Stafford at the 4-7. You are up at the 4-8, and you ended up taking Saquon Barkley. I took Barkley. I was actually hoping Russ fell to me at the 4-8 because, listen, like when you're doing a dynasty startup draft, you can – kind of figure out your strategy on the fly and you're never, you know, you're not drafting based on starting lineup, right? Like if I took Russ, the, the starting quarterbacks in a dynasty startup draft will never be as cheap as they are in these drafts. As soon yep. as the season starts, you can't trade for a starting quarterback in a dynasty super flex league. So I'm fine. I'm going to be honest. Like I, I would probably take Justin Fields here in a lot of situations, but the fact that I have Josh Allen right now and we have Stefan Diggs sitting there who just caught that four year extension yep. makes me overly hard to grab him right now. So I'm going to go with Barkley in the first pick of that round and then grab Stefan Diggs. So I think that solidifies like a little bit of safety on top of the ceiling I got with the quarterbacks. Saquon, obviously a risky pick. And I mean, him, he was like, I, I had a startup draft last year where I think I took him at like the 105 and now right. I'm getting him at the four eight. And, you know, the red flags are everywhere when it comes to Saquon right now. He's getting up there in age, and we can continue to make excuses for him, and the team is still not good, the quarterback situation, the offensive line. He's just the guy that I will continue to bet on from a talent standpoint. And now, I mean, at the 4'8", the risk is obviously so much lower than in previous years. So I'm fine uh, throwing a little dart there for the upside. And because I faded running back early on, if he does hit, like my team, the ceiling on my team is ridiculous. 
yeah, the drop off in value for Saquon Barkley year over year. Uh, and it's understandable, you know, like based on what we saw last year, I think this is a fine spot to be taking Saquon Barkley because we have absolutely no idea what is going to happen here with him in New York uh, moving forward in his career. But yeah, like you mentioned a year ago, going at the 105, 102 in some instances, now all the way down at the 4-8. Stefan Diggs, I was eyeing him here. Uh, at the at my pick, you ended up taking him off the board at the 5-3. Love that stack there with Josh Allen. So your team so far, Josh Allen, Deshaun Watson, A.J. Brown, Saquon Barkley, Stephon Diggs. Then we had J.K. Dobbins, Justin Fields, Nick Chubb, Travis Kelsey. And then at the 5-8, I ended up taking Kenneth Walker here. As I was looking at the wide receiver board, there were some players here that I could take uh, the shot on, right? With Garrett Wilson, Deontay Johnson. But even as we look at that at that board, and you can see this over on YouTube, all these guys kind of fall into the same tier at this point now where I really didn't feel like that was a massive uh, a position that I needed to grab at that point to be my wide receiver one. Now with Kenneth Walker looking at who is my RB one in this class, looking at Walker and the running back position and how quickly it dries up in dynasty startup drafts. I wanted to get that position on uh, uh, my RB three onto the roster here. So I'm um, back up at the six, three, I will go here with, Chris Godwin to be my wide receiver one, feel incredibly solid, steady with Godwin. There are some other guys on the board that have more upside, but I just feel incredibly solid and reliable with what I get with Chris Godwin. So David Montgomery after the Kenneth Walker pick, Cam Akers, Deontay Johnson, Garrett Wilson at the 6'2", Chris Godwin at the 6'3", that I took. Then Aaron Rodgers, DJ Moore, Drake London, the wide receiver out of USC, Darren Waller at the 6'7", your backup at the 6'8". I am going to take... Travis Etienne here, and you're doing the strategy that I would typically do, where it's just quarterbacks, running backs, quarterbacks, running backs, and then like every wide receiver kind of falls into the same tier once you get to a certain point, which is like basically what you hit on. And it almost makes no sense to grab wide receivers early like I did because you're getting the positional values so, so similar once you get down in draft board. Um, Travis Etienne is a guy that I know is looked at as, as a pretty – risky guy right now coming off the Liz Frank injury, but most of the uh, studies and the research will show you that like you're completely healed after 12 to 13 months, I believe. And he's had the entire season plus the off season to right. get back from it. So I'm, I'm not concerned about the injury as much. He's still a super, super young player um, under the age of 23, I believe right now. And you know, this, I mean, this Jaguars offense is only, only up to go. Uh, James Robinson has the Achilles tear. So who knows if he'll ever be back to his normal self. And then you just look at, you know, Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne, like, Back at Clemson, I think the the reason that they drafted ETN to begin with was because they wanted to make uh, Tr Trevor Lawrence happy and they wanted to make him comfortable. And who better than the pass catching running back that he dumped off fifty passes to? So I think we see ETN, you know, fall right into a monster pass catching workload uh, off the rip, and he's a young, explosive um, running back with some size. I need to make a pick here, and I'm going to go with. Oh come on, man! Michael Pittman. <laughs> you wanted Pittman? Yeah. Yep. So Pittman, Pittman's a guy I'm so on right now uh, with Matt Ryan coming in. I mean, Pittman, he was good last year, like 83, 85 catches over a thousand yards with Carson Wentz, who was like, look at any of the, any of the basic numbers, any advanced numbers. And that dude was so bad last year for Indy. The fact that his like touchdown interception ratio was as clean as it looks on paper is mind blowing to me. And uh, Pittman was awesome. And you look at some of the success rates he's had versus man versus zone overall, he was an awesome, awesome receiver. And I think we see that third year massive breakout this year. I think he goes for like 1400 yards and we start looking at him as like a possible second round redraft pick next year. Love Michael Pittman Jr. Have since he came out of USC that he was my guy last year, had a lot of shares. I literally had just settled in. I was like, okay, if Michael Pittman Jr. is there on the clock at the 7-8, great, I'm going to take him. And then you drafted him at the 7-3. Uh, Elijah Moore at the 7-4, Devontae Smith. I'm now back up on the clock. I'm looking at wide receiver, but I cannot pass up on the value of Ezekiel Elliott at this point, at the 7-8. No matter what your opinion is of Zeke, of Zeke and what he's going to be next year, getting Ezekiel Elliott at the 7-8 is ridiculous value. Like To be my RB4 on my roster, if we can look at his past season and say that was attributed to the torn PCL that he was playing with from week four on, then I have an incredible, incredible value at the back end of the seventh round and a guy that I don't need to hit, right? I don't need Zeke to hit, but if he does, now I've got an incredible trade piece where people are going to look at him again and say, okay, based on what we saw last year, it was the injury. Maybe I overreacted. The 7-8 is just ridiculous. I had to scoop, scoop him up there. So uh, that did lead to the player that I wanted to draft there at the 7-8, go off the board. That is Jerry Judy at the 8-2. I wanted to draft Judy there. Instead, I will go with 
Uh, I'll go with an incoming rookie here. I'll take the shot here. I'll balance out Chris Godwin. Again, I'm going to need to get some uh, proven depth here because both these guys are going to be injured at the start of the season. I'm going to go Jamison Williams, the wide receiver out of Alabama. Big play threat. You talk about that with Travis Etienne and what he can do as far as just taking one play. That's all you need for him to hit as a, and produce as an RB2. Then with Jamison Williams, all it takes is one big play for him, utilizing his speed deep downfield to be that player that puts your roster over the top that week. Go Jamison Williams here as my wide receiver too. You're back up at the 8-8. Yeah, so this is again where I would think about quarterback because like you're not going to find a cheaper time to grab guys like Zach Wilson or even like Kirk Cousins and Derek Carr are going to go. You're going to need to pay a first round price for them if you want to swap for them mid-year. So there's a lot of value to taking the quarterback. But I want to pass only because right now I look at A.J. Dillon and I see him in a tier of his own not because I think he's going to be like a key piece of a championship run this year, but it's very clear to me how the Packers see him. And it's also very clear what Aaron Jones's contract says. And it says that at the end of 2023, he's no longer a Green Bay Packer because they're going to save a lot of money by moving him or moving on from him. And Aaron Rodgers is there for three to four years. And A.J. Dillon will be the starting running back for at least two of them. And I think, I mean, we know what A.J. Dillon's going to be. Uh, on the, I think he's basically like a – a poor man's Javante Williams when both of them are the featured backs, which is a really good player to have in fantasy football. So with AJ Dillon, I think you're getting an RB one next year, which, you know, I have two risky running backs right now in ETN and Barkley. And I think he kind of shores that up for the future for me. Uh, and then I probably need to get a little bit more youth around just all around on the team. So we're going to take an incoming rookie and that's Chris Olave. Now Olave is a guy that, um, I I really like he, I I can't seem to put him up into like the tier of Burks and yeah. uh, London and, and those guys and whatever. But he is someone that I think can be like a Tyler Lockett where he can definitely have upside. He can finish as like a wider, the wide receiver 11 or the 14 or 15. You're not going to build your entire passing offense around him, but he could be super, super, super good if you need to have him as the one. And we also have a sweet spot of the draft this year where Kansas City and Green Bay both have two picks in the twenties and one of each of those picks for both those teams are going to go to a wide receiver. And there's a very good chance that Olave ends up being that guy. He can go much earlier, which, you know, is also a good thing because that means more draft capital, et cetera. So yep. Olave is a guy that I'm really, really uh, feeling good about just like having as a safe pick plus adding a lot of youth to your roster. Yeah. And again, you're getting him. It's all in, in comparison to where you're getting him on your roster and you're getting him as your wide receiver four. So mm -hmm. Olave there as that depth piece that has the upside Love that selection. I'm going to go here with Derek Carr to be that QB3. You talk about where in this territory you're starting to see the quarterback board dry up here, right? You got Zach Wilson, Kirk Cousins, Sam Howell, Ryan Tannehill, Desmond Ritter. Like it's getting gross here pretty quick as that QB3. You need to have three quarterbacks. Uh, quarterbacks are currency in super flex leagues. You have to have, you can never have enough of them because if another team, you know, gets an injury to that position, they're going to come to your roster and you can hold them ransom for a premium draft pick there to send off that player. So Derek Carr there, and we got guys like Noah Fant, Brandon Ayuk, Hunter Renfro, Leonard Fournette going off the board. I'm going to go back to the wide receiver position here. I'm a little thin at that spot. I'm going to go here with looking at the board. I'm going to go with Allen Robinson. Uh, at this point, I don't think that the ADP has caught up with Robinson uh, for him landing in LA. This is still an incredible value. I think a lot of people are panicking over the age, but we're looking at him being the wide receiver too, the number two receiving option here in this LA Rams offense. Uh, I feel really, really comfortable grabbing Allen Robinson here at the 10-3. I think that is phenomenal value. You are back up at the 10-8, my friend. Man, there's a lot of sexy wide receivers still on the board, but like you said, quarterback is currency, and I think we should like dive into that point a little bit, man, because quarterback is, it, it, that's a great way to put it. Like quarterback is literally currency because when you're trading in dynasty, like you trade for quarterbacks because you need them. You don't do that with any other position. You trade in dynasty for running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends because you like players. Like that's why you do that. But quarterbacks, you trade out of necessity. Like you need money, you need currency, you need yep. them in your starting lineups. And therefore, they will always have value, even if they're a even if they're basically a bad player. So I'm looking at the quarterback board and I kind of like Ryan Tan. I I want to give Zach Wilson another chance because yep. I mean, listen, there's nowhere to go for Zach Wilson, hopefully, but up 10, eight, a lot of people probably already write him off as a, um, as a bus. And I'm actually going to double down on quarterback here. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Zach Wilson. And then I'm going to go with his counterpart, a rookie, which this is really risky. And Howell might not end up going in the first round. So I'd probably switch his pick out, but I almost feel like if you take 
Zach Wilson with Sam Howell here, you're almost getting a repick on Zach Wilson. You're like, okay, Zach Wilson can hit, but you're also getting Zach Wilson again as a rookie. So maybe he hits this time around because I think they're similar players. Howell's a little bit more athletic. I could probably go with more safety here, like Tannehill or Cousins, and maybe I would do that. But, you know, we're on YouTube. We're having a little fun here. And I mean, too, like you've got like have the upside swing for the fences, right? I don't think that with Josh Allen, with Deshaun Watson, you need to take the Cousins right there. You know, like you exactly. have if you hit if you take Howell and he hits or Zach Wilson and he hits, now you've got the ability to ship off those guys for multiple first round picks, not just a first round pick to reload, but multiple, because again, the quarterbacks are currency in super flex leagues. If you do not have quarterbacks in a super flex league, you are not going to compete. All right. I am back up here at the 11, eight. I'm looking at the wide receiver board here as I've only got Chris Godwin, Jamison Williams, Allen Robinson. I've got Ezekiel Elliott as my RB four here. So I think I can push that running back five running back six down the board a little bit here. I'm going to go with Gabe Davis again, swing for the fences here. looks like he's going to be a starter attached to Josh Allen here next year. I think that Gabe, we saw what Gabe Davis could do in that playoff game against Kansas city. I think that, you know, we can't expect four touchdowns every single week, but I do think that the upside is there for him again, as my wide receiver four. this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful spot to take that shot with the upside there on Gabe Davis. I'm back up at the 12, three. I'm going to come back here and grab another. Ooh, uh, I didn't get, all right. So I was about to take sky Moore, the wide receiver out of Western Michigan, mm. who I'm very, very high on, but I am actually looking at the wide receiver board. I didn't get Jerry Judy there at the seven, eight. I took Zeke instead. I'm going to get another share of the Denver Broncos wide receiver room. I'm going to go Cortland Sutton here at the 12th. Ah. I think that this is an incredible value for Sutton. I don't understand why he's still here at the 12, three. That's got to come shooting up. I would be comfortable taking Sutton at the seven, eight, maybe even in the sixth round. Like I think that he is going to hit and hit in a big way as my wide receiver five. I am perfectly happy with that selection. You're back up at the 12, eight. Yeah. I know you don't have my screen, uh, part of the, sh the, like the, the recording right now, but I had two guys in my queue and it was sky Moore and Cortland Sutton. And I would have <laughs> went with Sutton over sky Moore, but I'll take the rookie wide receiver again. Like it's, it's always a good idea to take rookies in your, uh, in your startup draft, man, because their value tends to skyrocket. And they're like one of the few players where even if they have a down year, you could still move. Like after Jalen Rager's rookie year, you were still able to move them for like a back first early second round. Cause people yeah. just have that hope and that upside. And they like to make excuses for why these players, and produce so those guys are you got like a two-year window with early uh draft capital type wide receivers and i think sky moore is another guy that fits into that bill where he might land with green bay or kansas city early in the nfl draft um okay we're looking at man the running back value is really really ugly right <laughs> yep. now yeah so i think i'll continue to dip into the wide receiver room and this is pretty ugly too sheesh uh, if this was a real draft right now, I would continue. I'm actually probably just going to do that. Um, I'm going to take Ryan Tannehill here. I will take another quarterback in the super flex league and I'll be able to flip. See, you could flip Ryan Tannehill. I just got him in the 13th round, but you'll be able to flip Ryan Tannehill plus like a third or a second for someone that's in the sixth round or the fifth round or the yep. seventh round. Once someone gets hurt and he's a quarterback. So I have no problem if quarterbacks continue to drop in your startup drafts, like hammer the starting quarterbacks, hammer them, hammer them, hammer them. Yep, absolutely. All right, here at the 13-8, I'm going to go with another wide receiver who is not going to be ready to start the season, but the upside is absolutely there. I'm going to go Michael Gallup, uh, the wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys. Just signed the contract extension. No Amari Cooper in town. He's the wide receiver two currently for Dak Prescott alongside C.D. Lamb. I think this is great value for uh, Michael Gallup at the 13-8. I think that's baking into, right, that he's not going to be ready to start the season, but when he does come back, he's going to produce in a big way. we got Calvin Ridley at the 13-9, Damian Pierce, uh, John Mechie, Wandale Robinson, uh, all going off the board in between my picks around the turn, back up at the 14-3. I'm going to go back to the queue here. I'm going to go with Alexander Madison. And Madison, I do not have Dalvin Cook, but I think that once I get past the top four running backs in my roster on a dynasty league, I am perfectly comfortable and I'm looking to take the chances on these high upside running backs here. I've got the solid stable group here with my top four running backs that I can turn to any of them if I need to, to fill starting spots. But then I'm going to just throw darts with the RB five on, on my dynasty roster, because if Dalvin cook gets injured, we, which we know is going to happen at this point of his <laughs> career, then we've got Alexander Madison who I can plug in as that high insurance, high upside player. Then uh, again, guys like, you know, Daryl Williams for me last year, I was getting Daryl Williams everywhere because what happened if CEH got injured, we saw what happened there. So Alexander Madison, I'm taking him in dynasty drafts, even if I do not have uh, Dalvin Cook on my roster because of the upside. 
You were up at the 14-8. You took one of my sleeper tight ends here. That is Albert Okwegbunam here at the 14-8. Love that selection. Then you double back at the 15-3 with Jalen Tolbert, the wide receiver out of South Alabama. Talk about both those picks. Yeah, so Albert O, I mean, there's no way that he's going to be going this far down in real startup drafts once, you know, July, August roll around. He's, you know, super athletic, nothing nothing new here to say about him. But now, you know, no offense out of the way, he's with Russell Wilson. I'm not, like, sold that Albert O is going to be good. I'm not sold that he's going to be, like, a great NFL player, a great fantasy asset. But down here, I mean, he has – he's one of the few guys – I mean, you look at, like, Cole Komet. You look at, you know, Zach Ertz was a guy I was debating doubling down with at the tight end pick. But look at the other guys like Trey McBride and I, I guess – is Schultz and Knox are like three rounds ahead of him. But I think Albert O has as much upside as any tight end that you're getting outside of like the first eight rounds. So why not swing on him if I don't have uh, a tight end on my team yet? And I, you know, I thought about doubling down with Zach Ertz as someone who's going to be really safely involved in that Cardinals offense. But instead I went Tolbert and I was deciding between Tolbert and Adam Thielen and Jalen Tolbert's comp for me was Adam Thielen. So I'm like, listen, mm. I'm in a dynasty startup. Like I could take Thielen right now and get a bunch of like wide receiver two weeks out of him for like maybe one more year. Or I could take the 21 year old version of Adam Thielen and hope he hits some upside there. Hope he, I, I think Tolbert's an awesome player. He's a really, really solid possession receiver. And in the 15th round, uh, give me the younger player here and I can live without ha having Adam Thielen for a year or two. Cause that's probably about all he has left. So your pick of uh, Albert O reminded me that I literally had not drafted a tight end yet. Uh, so I was like, probably we should do that at some point. So I went with Zach Ertz here. As we look at that tight end board, it was like uh, some guys like Hunter Henry, who I thought just drastically outproduced uh, from a touchdown perspective last year. I don't expect that to continue. Uh, these other guys that I just felt like were swing for the fences. With Zach Ertz, though, we know what to expect. And he just signed that contract extension to stay in Arizona, feel comfortable and safe with him. And then I'll double back here in a couple rounds and take that shot on the swing for the fences tight end here. I'll go Zach Ertz because I know what he's going to give me. Then at the 16-3, I grab one of the guys that I'm grabbing and targeting everywhere in Dynasty Leagues this offseason. That's Khalil Herbert, mm. the running back for the Chicago Bears. We are just one, looking at we were looking one, for yeah, him in the queue. <laughs> yeah, we're one running back injury away from David Montgomery. Again, this is that strategy of RB5, RB6, take the swing for the fences with the high upside running backs. Khalil Herbert, we saw what happened. We saw the talent. Now he's the RB2 in Chicago, guaranteed. And we saw with Luke Getze coming in as the offensive coordinator from Green Bay, A.J. Dillon, Aaron Jones, we saw them split work last year. There's a possibility that Khalil Herbert sees some standalone value on his own here and takes away some work from David Montgomery. So he has the upside with Montgomery, but then also has the potential to be a guy that sees some standalone value. At the 16-8 and the 17-3, you went with Irv Smith, who I was eyeing there, and then Christian Kirk. Talk about both those selections. Yeah, one, I love the Khalil Herbert pick for you. He was someone that um, last year, any startup I did, I made sure I left with Khalil Herbert. He was a guy that I really, really liked in the rookie class. And this year, it was, uh, I mean, it was good to see how much Chicago trusted him. When David Montgomery went down, when Damian Williams got hurt, like they had no problem giving him 20 touches per game. David Montgomery, it's an interesting, you know, I talked about liking A.J. Dillon for the fact that very, very rare chance that they actually bring Aaron Jones back after the 2023 season or after this year. Um with David Montgomery, he's one of those guys that, dude, I don't know if he's a second contract type of player sure. at the running back position. Might be for another team, might be in like that Melvin Gordon mold or something. But, you know, you get the second contract type of guys who are like really elite, like the Alvin Kamars and the Mixons. Those guys get the second contract with the team that they played for. I'm not sure David Montgomery gets that. And if he moves on, I mean, Khalil Herbert, I feel like very, very likely takes over the, uh, the, the backfield there and Khalil Herbert becomes the guy behind, you know, hopefully a good Justin Fields uh, led offense. And with Irv Smith, he's a guy that most people forgot about super athletic tight end that I was excited about uh, coming into last year and then toward the ACL, of course, but they got rid of uh, Tyler Conklin. They got rid of all the uh, tight ends that they had outside yep. of him. And there's still a very condensed target share between just Justin Jefferson and the, you know, older uh, Adam Thielen. So I like Irv Smith as like an under the radar comeback player this year. And then Christian Kirk in the 17th round, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> 80 million dollars this year I, there's nothing else really to say what if trevor lawrence takes a step that we thought trevor lawrence was going to take last year this year and kirk just ends up being the wide receiver one there you have a 25 year old on an 80 million dollar contract not a not a bad spot to get him there yep absolutely i mean yeah for him to get that guaranteed money we know that he's going to get the targets we know that he's going to be involved in the offense which is more than what we can say for a lot of these guys as we're starting to get into this territory of the 17th round and on in dynasty startup drafts at this point you're looking for the guys who at least have the guaranteed opportunity uh gus edwards for me at the 17 8 uh, in that running back mold here where gus edwards is an incredible value in dynasty startup drafts it's been a while since we've seen him but 
we know that J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards are going to split that backfield. We know Edwards it has the talent to produce. And then again, the upside, just like I talked about with Khalil Herbert, the upside is there if Dobbins misses time again with an injury. Then I went with Tyler Boyd here at the 18-3 just to build in some stability and safety. I don't know if I'm ever going to feel comfortable starting Tyler Boyd in my uh, Dynasty League here, but... Again, we're looking for depth in dynasty drafts. So Tyler Boyd there, if I can't get Michael Gallup, uh, you know, these other guys, Chris Godwin, Jamison Williams, if they aren't ready to go here by week three, I at least feel that I can plug in Tyler Boyd and at least get some solid stability there uh, for those few weeks there. So Tyler Boyd at the 18-3, not an inspiring, not a sexy pick, but one that I'm perfectly comfortable making. You went with Will Fuller at the 18-8. That is a surprising selection, my friend. Uh, talk about that one a little bit. Uh, I just don't see a, a world where he doesn't end up in Cleveland pairing back up with Deshaun Watson there. And if that's the case, uh, you know, give me Will Fuller for two or three years. And we saw him and um, we saw him and Watson just make magic together in Houston for the limited time that they were together. So that was kind of like a panic pick, to be honest with you, with the time running out and just <laughs> yep. like being at this point of startup drafts. It's just like uh, it's who do you not hate the most right and it's really hard to go down the list and, and figure that out at this point this is usually where i start taking like shots at high upside running backs and i don't even know if feather baddy is one of those guys but he's uh he's an interesting prospect with a lot of explosive speed he's someone that could play all three downs and the the rookie class will come together after the nfl draft obviously and we'll know more capital whereas as i'm not going to be taking a sixth or seventh round um running back that was drafted at that point in the draft over like a third, fourth round running back. And those will kind of play themselves out. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're at, we're at that point in startups, man, you know? Yep, for sure. All right. So Alan Lazard here at the 19, eight, I feel like he is being overlooked uh, here. Very uh, nice. Wide receiver one for green Bay. Currently uh, I expect green Bay to add, you know, either in the NFL draft, you've hinted at that several times, but then also like they could go out and trade for a Brandon cooks. Uh, you know, they could send away significant capital to uh, pry DK Metcalf away from Seattle. Like those are possibilities here. Alan Lazard, though, at this point of startup drafts is worth taking the shot on. Then I'm going to come back here and go with a player who is in, who just left the Green Bay wide receiver core here. Again, I feel like this is an oversight in ADP. He's got to move up. MVS, uh, the wide receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, I think that he is going to fill a very valuable role catching passes from, you know, Patrick Mahomes. He could be the wide receiver one for Patrick Mahomes, the wide receiver one, not the number one receiving option. We, of course, know that is Travis Kelsey, but that's going to have value. And at the 20th, in the 20th round, that's worth taking the shot on. You were back up at the 28. Back up at the 28. Uh, I think I'm going to grab my third tight end here and take in Joku here and just you know keep piling up uh keep piling up around Deshaun Watson because I think when he gets back on the field that on paper is likely to be the best offense in the NFL you look at it you have a superstar quarterback you have a top five if not number one overall offensive line you have um uh pure possession receiver number one in Cooper you have hopefully a field stretcher and Will Fuller this is what I'm banking on so I've drafted the team and a real slot receiver and possibly Jarvis Landry as well coming back. And then you have an, uh, an exciting athletic tight end, David Njoku. So I will take the quarterback. I will take the pieces that the quarterback is throwing to. And then we will look elsewhere. And just really um, quick, it, I okay. was laughing because I had literally just added Njoku to my queue. Literally, like right before you selected him. So yes, good selection there. Uh, David Njoku there. The upside is absolutely there. And he's in talks to sign that long-term contract extension, be tied to Deshaun Watson for the long-term now in Cleveland feel like that is a fine chance to take there in the back end of the 20th round uh this is a panic pick too i didn't want to take davis there he was really good last year and i think he'll get better with zach wilson getting better but more is clearly gonna be better than Corey davis is and they're also i mean it, when there's smoke there's fire they're yeah. probably taking a high uh a high yep. pick wide receiver there so there's a chance that davis just falls immediately back into the wide receiver three role and it's not really what you want and i probably should have shot for like a rookie um running back at this point but you know it is what it is yeah i think you know there's a ton of talk right now that i even with the new york jets going after tyreek hill like they were in on amari cooper too like i think that this wide receiver core is adding another premium player here and they've got four top 50 picks to do that so i do expect someone else to be added but davis fine safe option you know what you're getting out of him uh, i'll go to here with tim patrick i'll continue to invest in that Denver Broncos wide receiver core, who I think is going to be it's that offense is going to be really good this next year. I'm buying into it. So I got Cortland Sutton earlier. I will double back here with Tim Patrick. And then at the 22 three here, I'm going to go with, I'll push the tight end, my second tight end uh, down the board a little bit. I'm going to go with a rookie wide receiver who 
I think that I saw someone tweet this out and I cannot remember who posted it. Otherwise I would talk about them, but they talked about Calvin Austin, the wide receiver out of Memphis. And they said, Austin should be getting as much hype as Rondale Moore did last year coming out of Purdue. And I think that they are absolutely correct. Austin, a freak athlete, incredibly, not just a smaller wide receiver who you really get the ball in space and let him create, but he can make tight, ca- he can make catches in tight windows. He can make some contested catches there. Surprisingly, outside of his frame, again, we just saw him blow up the NFL combine. I feel really, really good getting uh, Calvin Austin here in the 22nd round. You're back up at the 22 8. Yes. Um, so I'm going to grab my guy, Eno Benjamin, off the Cardinals. He is a player that I'm trying to draft in all startup leagues. He's, he's a guy whose prospect profile is pretty awesome. Um, it's very similar to like a guy like Aaron Jones. Eno just hasn't got the chance to really get onto the field. And I don't know if he ever will, but Chase Edmonds is out of there in Arizona. And he can very much fill that role. And I mean, we saw Eno get a little bit of playtime last year and he looked amazing in the small glimpses. And I hate to take a small sample size and try to like extradite it. But again, we're in the 22nd round. So right. I like, you know, Benjamin um, and he's like the only other guy there. And James Conner doesn't have the most flawless injury history going yep. back a few years. So there's a chance, Eno gets a really big workload in a few games this year. And at this point, you're looking for any sort of like random RB one weeks or wide receiver one weeks like. If James Conner gets hurt at any point next year, like, you know, Benjamin's going to be ranked inside the top 15 to 17 running backs yep. and on a weekly basis. So we'll go with him and then we'll go with a uh, a rookie running back in Kevin Harris out of South Carolina that weighed in at like 5'11", 220 pounds, um, supposedly ran a very fast 40 time. And you can see that on film when he gets a hold of that, that dude breaks away. His burst score from the combine in terms of like a vertical jump and broad jump were really, really explosive. So he's a guy who on paper dominated in the SEC as a sophomore, um, has a lot of uh, upside that I think more people need to probably recognize and start talking about. I like the film. I like Harris's film. Uh, he has the the ability that I look for in a running back to be able to quickly shift momentum. And you see that just based on the fact that he has gigantic quads. Like he's able to <laughs> sit low and be able to shift that momentum and explode off of each leg. Uh, you know, you're looking at a production profile that dipped off drastically this past year. But looking at the tape, you see the traits there. So I'm really interested to see where he goes in the NFL draft. But I do like the player. I, I think go- he broke his back in the summer. I think he broke his yes, back and played right. through he it this something. year. So yep. I don't know if that's like, you know, if people who just like him are making that as an excuse or if it's actually a real medical thing. But that's definitely something that might have made him uh, drop off a bit. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Here, Marlon Mack in the 24th round. I'll take another running back here at this point who just signed with Houston. Now, I really do not want to invest in the Houston backfield uh, where you've got like seven other running backs currently on the roster. But I do think that Mack is going to get the main opportunity there if they do not add someone else in the NFL draft. So take the shot there on Marlon Mack. You took Keontae Ingram, the running back out of, he was at Texas, now at UCLA, USC. right? USC, USC. USC. Yes. Uh, Keontae Ingram there, and then Antonio Brown at the 25-3, taking the uh, chance that Antonio Brown is going to get signed before he gets surgery on the ankle. Bro, he's going to tweet his life into existence. He's, some, <laughs> he's eventually going to land somewhere and become like a wide receiver too for fantasy at some point next year. Some contender is going to be like, all right, we need him for the stretch run. I think he, I think I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up back in Tampa Bay, man, with Bruce Arians out of there. And Tom Brady's going to be like, this is what I want. Give it right. to me. Um, so yeah, why not take a shot on Antonio Brown there in the last, one of the last picks of the draft. Um, and then with, uh, Conte Ingram, yeah, he just had like a nice little breakout year at USC. And if you look at his profile, man, he's also built like 220 pounds. He can he can catch passes. Uh, ran a four five three, so for his size, just very very athletic and very under the radar in terms of like what he's able to do. And you look at the advanced analytics; he's a good tackle breaker. He does everything well. I just have no idea what his draft capital is going to end up being. Right. Oh no, I let my time. I let my time run out. Hey, okay. It took me. from the queue. It took from the queue. All right, perfect. Uh that was Hayden Hurst there, who I wanted to take. And then glad I loaded up the queue because it just auto drafted me for the final two picks who I just had two pick uh two players in the queue. That's fine. Hayden Hurst at the 25-8, and then I took James White there at the 26-3. Now, James White, I mean, I might get one more year of like decent production out of him. But we saw that when he was healthy, uh, he was getting, you know, he was a PPR machine uh, with Mac Jones there. So I feel I feel fine adding James White there as some running back depth there. And then Hayden Hurst as my tight end three to get that guy who can be just taking multiple dart throws there, right? I've got Gerald Everett at the 23-8. Took Hayden Hurst there at the 25-8. I'll throw multiple darts there. One of them hits, great. I've got that high upside player behind Zach Ertz. To wrap it up, you went with Trey McKitty, the tight end for the LA Chargers. Talk about that one really quick, and then we are out of here. 
Yeah, he's another exciting, like, young tight end that's kind of a dart throw, but they did just sign your boy, Gerald Everett, who you took, who's likely going to play over him. But really all Gerald Everett's done is disappoint you're in and you're out. So at this point, like, maybe maybe he's just nothing. Uh, they, clar- they clearly didn't feel that comfortable playing McKitty last year. They had Jared Cook play a lot of that role. So it's like, you know, I think either Trey McKitty or Gerald Everett is going to end up, like, playing the Jared Cook role. And McKitty's younger and hasn't proved to be nothing at this point like Gerald Everett has again over and over again. So I don't know, whatever, let's see. Let's take a shot on him for sure. All right. If you want to see the final draft board, make sure to go over to youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook. You can see the draft board here uh, all laid out. We're not going to run through the entire team just because we would be here for the next 20 minutes. We're not going to do that. Nick, this was fun, man. Chopping it up for the first time uh, doing a podcast together. Why don't you let everyone know where they can find you on social media and what you got going on? Yeah, so uh, this was my first dynasty startup draft of the summer. I've just been doing a lot of uh, rookie focused stuff, and you realize just like you you re remember just how hectic hectic startup drafts are, and yep. always remember just like ADP doesn't matter because everyone goes into their draft with such different strategies. Some people are going straight into rebuild. Some people are going straight for win win now. So you know if you want to draft a guy three rounds higher than his ADP, by all means, that's like exactly yep. what you should be doing. So just remember that when you're going through the draft. Um, but in terms of where you guys can find me on YouTube, it's uh, BDG, the brand name, Big Dog's Gotta Eat. And then on the socials, me personally, it's just Nick Ercolano. It's E-R-C-O-L-A-N-O. Uh, I'll just be talking a lot on Twitter, most likely. Absolutely, man. Love your work. Appreciate you taking some time out of your day to come on and talk some Dynasty Startup. Again, super, super fun. All right, that'll do it for Nick Ercolano. I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time.